This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Hello, world, and welcome to a Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta. Today's sponsor is A2 Hosting. I've been using A2 Hosting solid state hosting solutions for our website at geekleader.com for many, many years now and absolutely love their support, their service, and all the features that you get. You get access to cPanel. You get all of the things that you can imagine for a great WordPress experience, including their A2 optimized WordPress, which does extra security checks, extra lockdown. It, you can lock down your editor uh, file so you can't edit anything inside there. You get alerts whenever there are file changes that are done. Um, you can also do automatic updates, backups, and more with A2 hosting. So highly recommend it. Go to a geekleader.com slash A2 to get more information and to sign up for their solid state turbocharged speed hosting today. Again, that's a geekleader.com slash A2. All right, Geek Leaders, today I'm honored to have Unmesh Srivastava on the show. He is the Chief Technology and Digital Information Officer with Clever Health Plan. We're going to talk about AI, we're going to talk about data, we're going to talk about health. Uh, with all that being said, uh, Unmesh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, John. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Excited. Yeah. So if you don't mind, just tell the audience a little bit about your background and kind of how you got to where you are today in your career. And what is it that you guys do over at Clever Care? Absolutely. So, um, well, a little bit about myself. I am a, a, a first generation immigrant in the U.S. and uh, I was born and raised in India. Uh, came to the States in 2008 uh, to pursue Master's of Science in Engineering Management and have been uh, pursued my Master's, have been working in healthcare for a really long time. I think I've spent around 15 years in healthcare. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm currently working with the Clevercare Health Plan, which is a, a very interesting organization. Uh, we are building a culturally sensitive uh, health insurance company for seniors. Um, as you know that, uh, you know, in this day and age, it's it's the age of consumerism. And, uh, you know, you get personalized uh, and concierge uh, stuff from everywhere, from Amazon, from Uber, from any, any experience, digital experience you get to. It is very personalized based off on your culture, your language, your preferences, and so forth. Uh, versus healthcare is very cut and dry and plain. So what we are doing at health uh, at Clever Care is we are building a culturally sensitive healthcare organization for folks who do not speak English as their first language and come from various disparate cultures. Um, for example, Koreans, Vietnamese, Chinese, and so forth. Um, and the way we are doing it is we built a health plan. Uh, where we have put together the benefit packages, which is a combination of both Western and Eastern medicine benefits, right? So you've got your traditional Western medicine, medical, dental, uh, vision, and so forth. But then we have amalgamated that with concepts of Eastern medicine, you know, herbal medication, acupuncture, Tai Chi, um, a and and we give an experience through both our um, on all levels, right? Our brokers are culturally sensitive. They speak in your language. Our physicians are culturally sensitive. Uh, we've contracted with a network of physicians who talk in these specific languages. And then um, also our member services, the way we support, uh, not just from a call center perspective, but also all the collaterals that we send to you are in language and are very focused on your culture. You know, they, it is sensitive by our culture. So we we are building this niche health plan, which will cater to this, uh, you know, to this individualization by language, culture, ethnicity, and so forth. So um, very interesting problem. And especially for me, being a first generation immigrant here, uh, I feel like there's there's definitely tailwinds that, that we can we can utilize here and and build a more uh, individualized health system. Yeah, I have to say, uh, you know, of all the things that I've seen, you know, kind of get shaken up and be be ready for disruption, uh, healthcare is definitely one of them. Uh, in the past year, I've had ACL surgery on my leg. My wife's also had ACL surgery. We've had our kid had you know tubes. We've gone through the healthcare system quite a bit, and uh, 
I can definitely see a lot of opportunities for improvement there. And it, there has been some acceleration too in adoption, you know, with, with COVID and people being able to do remote sessions and stuff like that has been helpful. Um, but now I think we're ready for the next phase. Uh, is, is that kind of where you guys are picking up? Absolutely. Absolutely. As I'm sure you saw going through that healthcare experience, there's just, there's just so much to do, so much to fix. And yeah. I feel like, uh, we have to think differently. We have to remove the barriers that uh, we have built around data, around uh, this. There's a bunch of things that are going on. And Clevercare is one of the examples of one of the organizations that, which has taken health equity, uh, you know, at uh, uh, that challenge and trying to solve that. So I completely agree. A uh, lot of work has been done, but there's a lot more to do in healthcare. Yeah, for sure. I think just... You know, you're talking about data and, and healthcare. Um, one of the challenges that we saw was just, you know, the redundancy of data when it comes to implementing things, you know, filling out forms as a, as a, you know, a very simple version of that, but also transmitting that information and getting it from one provider to another. Just if you have a simple question, the difficulty of, of getting communication into the doctor to ask that simple question, you know, and getting information back that that's in a way that you can understand, especially if you're looking at what you guys are helping out with people with that English isn't their, their primary language. I can, can imagine how difficult that would be. Absolutely, man. And I'm sure you would have seen that, right? We are still filling out paper forms. In uh, yeah. the 21st century, we are filling out paper forms at the input at a physician office. Uh, obviously, you are filling that out. Once someone who's taking that form is now keying that information in the system, Already, you've lost time. You've got, you've lost, uh, you know, hours that could have been very well used for providing care, right? Same thing on the physicians. They, while they're talking to you, they're entering all this data in EMR. Mm -hmm. It's just all very. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of redundancy and administrative, um, uh, you know, load built in the health system, which definitely needs uh, needs to be removed. I and mean, if you think about it, right? If you see the data. 20% of our GDP is uh, being spent in healthcare. And and we are one of the most uh, costly health systems in the world. And even with so much spend, the quality of care and the outcomes is much lower on the index. So clearly there's, there's a lot of opportunity in all aspects of data uh, analytics, workflows that need to be enabled, cybersecurity, um, you know, building, uh, bringing in more, um, th there's there's the clinical side of healthcare, but bringing in more mental health, behavioral health, uh, social determinants at the center. See, there's just, there's, there's a lot of opportunity that uh, we have in healthcare and lots to, lots to be fixed. Yeah, there really is. You know, and as you're talking about that, you're talking about, you know, multiple providers, right? V versus, you know, right now, if I, if I get sick, I go to one doctor for, for being sick and I go to another doctor, let's say for, um, you know, my leg that, that was injured and, and things like that. And, and there's my information is going bouncing around from place to place to place. And, you know, like you said, there's paper forms, there, there, there's insurance issues, there, there's connectivity between all this information. How do you see, you know, data and, and AI maybe helping some of this stuff in the future? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And and the word you said is bouncing around. Yes. And it is literally bouncing around. It's not being transmitted, right? So mm -hmm. if you went to a pharmacy, you went to your primary care, who then sent you for a surgery to a hospital. From there, you went to a pharmacy where you got your um, medicines. Um, you did a follow-up visit at a lab where you did your tests. Um, and then... Uh, in a three-month recovery period, you went back to your PCP, or you perhaps in this process, if if uh, if there are any complications, I hope there were none, you have to go back to the specialist. Now, imagine there are like six or seven entities which are involved in this one episode of uh, a healthcare need, and they're not talking to each other, by the way, right? They, they are literally, you have to um, they're not. There's no electronic transmission of data between these organizations. You have to request the data, and then it gets transmitted. And it's a it's a long process to get data if you get it between these entities, right? And I think that's really the opportunity for data and analytics in healthcare, right? Interoperability is something which 
everyone has talked about over years. Um, the way uh, the uh, our healthcare system is set up is run by administrators, and we have implemented EMRs, which are built like four walls, and you know you can't get data out of that wall, then it's hard to push data back in that wall. So um, there's definitely opportunity. Um, there are standards which are being implemented. One of the standard is FHIR or FHIR, um, which is being utilized to transmit data between these entities and between these systems. But I feel like the adoption of that has been slow. Uh, the government has been pushing for this interoperability rule wherein all these health systems are mandated to share data with each other uh, through this FHIR API, um, and it's a mandate. And similarly, health plans will have to share data with, with each other. And they also have to share data with the patients or the members um, or individuals. And that's a, uh, that's something which is also uh, you know mandated to the health system. So I think now, finally, we are trying to drive and push forward towards interoperability. But again, just like going back to your example, right? You said I had to fill out a paper form and then that paper form was taken by the front office desk and keyed into the system. The whole paper and unstructured data within healthcare still stays a big problem. It, it is a big problem. 30% of healthcare data, all healthcare data is unstructured. And, and transmission of that unstructured data extraction of information from that unstructured data, conversion of that unstructured data into structured data is all very big problems in healthcare, which are are being disrupted and being solved for, but there's still a lot of scope where, you know, things can be better. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned pharmacy, and that was another thing that's been a you know, real pet peeve of mine is, you know, just, you know, different types of medication, you know, for um, for people, yeah, you know, there's, there's certain rules around medication depending on where you are and when you can get it, and it, it gets very complicated. Especially like you know, if you have a, a monthly prescription for something and you can't refill it early because it's a you know considered a narcotic or something like that, so you have to wait till the you know three days before you run out before you can get it. But what if you're on vacation and you can't get it out of state? It gets really complicated and it's and it's difficult. Especially like you know we've had issues where the pharmacy was out, but they can't tell you they're out until you show up there and you get it and they're like, oh, we're out. You have to go to this other pharmacy, but we can't transfer your prescription. You have to call your doctor, get your doctor to resend a prescription over and it just becomes such a pain. And if all this was like connected somehow and could like talk to each other and know where the, the medicine is and how to transfer that, that prescription, it would make life so much easier. Completely agree. I cannot disagree with anything. I, I think pharmacies lap lab data which is sent back and forth there's mm -hmm. there's just a lot of opportunity but there's a lot of work being done in this area as well um i'm not sure like i'm sure a lot of your listeners do use iphone if you use iphone and you go into apple health one of the things that apple has been building um or a few years now is they're building the back end plumbing of of connecting health systems um with data so if you go in apple health you can connect to care delivery providers if they're part of that network where they've shared the data with Apple. You can see your lab data, your pharmacy data, all in one place. Uh, so I, I feel like absolutely that's a problem, but uh, there's a lot of disruption and folks like us working in healthcare, we uh, daydream of that world when we will uh, you know, connect all these health systems uh, with, with data transfer being uh, you know, very seamless. And uh, that's all I guess most of the health tech folks are working towards. Yeah. So um, we mentioned AI just briefly earlier and, you know, we couldn't really talk about, I couldn't have a, a tech podcast these days without talking about chat GPT. It seems like it's on, it's, it's the subject of everything right now. Um, how do you see chatbots and, um, you know, uh, models like that when it comes to AI helping the healthcare industry? Yeah, no, absolutely, man. Like, I, I, I feel like, uh, I, I think data and AI go hand in hand, right? So the the uh, bedrock layer of all AI is data, which I think is being fixed. Uh, data being concatenated from different areas and, you know, technology as well as other business process as well as policy changes are driving that. But once you start getting some of that data, making sense of that data at a large scale, um, 
and using it for uh, multiple different areas will be critical. So there's something, uh, I feel like AI has multiple different use cases in healthcare. I can tell you about some of the use cases we are utilizing right now. So uh, within the world of AI, there's, you know, natural language processing, natural language understanding, uh, you know, areas around how you can convert text to voice and voice to text and make sense out of that, right? Um, and uh, take unstructured data images and convert that into structured text or, or query that for critical information, right? So, uh, I mean, there's, there's so much unstructured data in healthcare. Uh, you send faxes, in, in this uh, day and age, you still send a lot of faxes and handwritten faxes, which get transmitted from one system to the other. And someone has to manually key that information in the system, whereas you can utilize um, NLP and do the text extraction. And you can, uh, you know, uh, sort of extract intelligence from that text, which you're transmitting from using images. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, the the whole voice to text right um, and text to voice, all that manual keying in of data into the systems. Now we are seeing a lot of like um, stuff like Nuance, right? It was acquired by Microsoft. Uh, Nuance Dragon Dictation type softwares, which are becoming more and more prevalent, um, where you can the system hears you talk and then converts that into structured uh, data. Uh, that is something, uh, there are a lot of startups in this space as well. Um, uh, there's one I know of, Robin Healthcare, which is doing great, great work there. Suki is another one. So there, there's, there are people who are trying to disrupt this industry quite a bit. So there's a lot of work on unstructured data in the form of text and voice and images, which uh, there's work there. Uh, there's chatbots, right? So on the chatbot side, uh, obviously chat GPT has just, you know, taken the world by by a storm. Uh, but, you know, we talk about engagement of members and people at a mass scale, and you cannot have a one-to-one -one call center type use case there, right? So let's say I, I need to get, uh, you know, you went through this whole system, right? Now, let's say you didn't get paid, your claim was not paid by the health insurance company. Now, if you were to go on if I'm the consumer, I would just expect going on the website and putting in, hey, where's my, go on the chat window and say, where's my claim? Okay, give me your claim number and, you know, you give your claim number or if it can be located, give my personal information, which is secure, and then I get my claim status versus calling someone, staying on the line for, you know, 10 minutes and then getting that, right? So I think bots will be, are being used and will be used in more and more, you know, deeper capacity to sort of um, uh, to sort of help the human workforce to drive first and second level engagements, right at scale, at a at a large population level. So I think bot in general, whether it it be Chat GPT or general chat bot technology, is that's an area. Member engagement, patient engagement is somewhere where we are driving a lot of that. Uh, you know, voice. Uh, sorry, the the text based. Uh, chat-based features where you don't have to call someone and, and be on the line, right? You can get instantly the information you need. Um, machine learning, deep learning is also an area which is being utilized quite heavily. I mean, we are doing uh, some work in that, uh, you know, disease progression, right? How do you know that, uh, you know, there's so much work being done in genomics. Now, disease progression is one area where there's, if, if you are a pre-diabetic, how are you going to, or if your diet is not right, you don't have the right social circle, you're living alone, you're not taking your medications on time, does this increase your risk of diabetes? And if we provide that information to your physician, can he or she uh, intervene way beforehand before that health system, health condition triggers, right? So there are multiple different machine learning, deep learning models that health systems are currently building, whether it be around disease progression, a risk stratification, your risk of going to a hospital uh, and, you know, being a frequent flyer there, your risk of uh, catching infections. There's a lot of work being done in the area of machine learning and deep learning as it relates to artificial intelligence. Um, robotics is another one. There's a lot of work being done there. So 
I, I think data and analytics, uh, data and AI go very much hand in hand and there's just, just a lot being done in that, that sector as well. Yeah. I, I, I love the, you know, use of that for preventative healthcare so you can kind of fix problems before they really arise into big things. And, you know, what you're talking about with the example of, you know, the insurance claim. So yeah, we, I, I kind of went through that process where, you know, insurance wasn't paying for my physical therapy and I didn't know why. And, you know, I call the physical therapy place and like, oh, you have to call your insurance. I call the insurance. Insurance says, well, you need to talk to your doctor. So then I have to call my doctor, which isn't affiliated with the physical therapy place that I'm at, to get the doctor to send a note to the insurance company so that they'd pay the physical therapist. So it was such a, you know, like I spent hours on the phone calling multiple people where, you know, like I said, if I could just talk to one chat bot and say, hey, this is what's happening and let them kind of, you know, send a message to the doctor and get everything approved and we go through an approval workflow or something that automatically takes care of this instead of me having to go back and forth it would it would have made life a lot easier correct correct and and the bot was what should have been enabled by data coming out of all these different places of service right from you yeah and take take it a step fur further we could even automate the process to where i don't even need to not notify it if you know, they detected that the insurance was denying a claim, it could automatically reach out to the doctor and say, why is this claim being denied? Should this person, you know, should you have, you know, a, a proactively go about this instead of waiting until I show up to get physical therapy and then say, hey, you owe this money because your claim got denied. You know, that is correct. That is correct. No, I completely agree with you. I went through a similar experience uh, with my daughter. Uh, and this is like four years ago, she fell on the stairs uh, cut her eyebrow, we went to get a suture. Uh, didn't realize that the hospital was in the network, but the guy who's doing the suture is not an affiliated physician, hence he's out of network. Um, and then, uh, you know, I get all these bills and I'm calling my insurance company and they're like, sure, you went to the hospital in, you know, in the ER, but by the way, you know, the, the physician who did this, uh, that the suture was not in the network. And I'm like, do you think my daughter is bleeding and I'm going to ask, as far as I'm concerned, I know the, the hospital is in the network. And I had to go on calls, multiple calls, um, still didn't get the re grievance, you know, resolved and I had to pay for the service. So experience like these, right, for people who are working in healthcare technology, these are, you know, us going through this same experience, I, I can empathize with folks who do not understand healthcare systems so deeply, right? Mm -hmm. Like like some of us. And uh, that's the goal, uh, John, with as we are building Clever Care. Our goal is to have that seamless transfer of data, to make sure we have one call resolution, to make sure we can cater to you in your language and culture, to make sure we get all the information from the network and someone who's on the call takes that responsibility to take, go talk to all these different parties and give you a resolution versus you calling, you know, four or five different health systems. So, uh, I mean, you are young. I, I feel for folks who are on Medicare, who are aging, for them to go through a similar experience like you did, uh, we all would have failed. And I'm sure this, uh, you know, as a health, as a as someone who provides care or is part of healthcare, we all fail collectively if if mm -hmm. we if they don't if they have to go through this experience. So um, that's what we are building, man. Like we are building an insurance company, a health plan which is um, builds a network of physicians who are empathetic, build the right um, you know benefit packages, and then build the right experience. Like I like I would like for my mother and my mom and dad to go through. I want to build an insurance company, which is, which is that, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. When I think about like, you know, just the little bit that I went through going through, you know, my knee surgery, if my mom had to go through that, would she even know how to look up the numbers for people to call? Would she even know where to go find this information? How difficult would that be, you know, for someone who, you know, is not tech savvy to, to figure this out? Yeah, it's very hard very hard and a lot of times that's why there's people talk about rising healthcare costs because of emergency room uh, ER visits by seniors right I mean a lot of times I feel like they don't have access to people to information to uh, access to their regular PCP and they end up calling 911 and going to the hospital because that's the easiest way to get someone to, to hear them out or listen to them 
versus if we as a uh, you know health system that includes the primary care that includes the uh, insurance provider were proactively identifying people's needs right disease progression whether they are uh, you know um, engaged in their healthcare or not and then proactively reaching out to them and and giving them that that you know uh, reassurance that we are here for you i think we could cut out a lot of unnecessary healthcare costs being caused by you know ER visits and uh, unnecessary admissions into hospitals, which really don't need to happen. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I would love to have it someday where, you know, anytime that I have any healthcare question, I can jump on a Zoom call. And even if it's talking to an AI that I can't really tell is an AI or whatever it is, give me information or reassurance to say, hey, you know, there's a 97% chance that you're fine. <laughs> you have nothing to worry about, you know. Or something like that, just to give you a little bit of reassurance sometimes so you're not just wasting time going to the ER to get checked out. I know, can I think about my sister? She, it, you know, <clears throat> went to the ER because she thought she hurt her arm. And, you know, it turns out that it was just a pulled muscle and, you know, it, it, it was no big deal. She probably could just took Tylenol, waited a day and been fine, you know. Um, yeah. So it would be awesome to have the ability just to jump on a Zoom call, you know, instantly and, and have that information taken care of. Uh, one question that I have when it comes to like, you know, using chat bots or whatever, um, uh, where is our data? Like, you know, we, we talked about data being kind of the foundation. When it, when it comes to privacy, is there any concerns that we should have entering our data into systems like this as, you know, individuals? Um, no, that's a great question. Now, as you know, <laughs> the pace of healthcare innovation is a, a little bit slower than other industries you see out there, right? Uh whether it be transportation or uh, FMCG or, you know, consumer goods or whatever. And big part of that is healthcare is very compliance, uh, security and privacy driven, right? So there's something called HIPAA, uh, Health yeah. Insurance uh, Portability and Accountability Act, which mandates all the health systems to be very, very careful around um uh, managing PHI, personal health information, personal information, if you get any personal financial information and so forth, right? Um, and through that, there's a, a compliance, like you have to get certified with something called high trust, which is a, you know, it's sort of the highest level of uh, systems being, you know, very secure and safe. I personally as a technology leader in healthcare, want to make sure that all the systems we use or recommend our physicians or patients to use uh, representing us are um, very secure, very safe, are HIPAA compliant, are mostly Hydra certified. And that's only when we present it. And I, I think that's the case with 100% of or most of the people who are building health systems are very focused on security and compliance. So if personally, that's why like chat GPT has so much scope outside, but folks in healthcare are cautiously pro proceeding with that until it is, we are sure that, you know, the, the data is centralized, decentralized, is secure, is safe, is, you know, your privacy is secured. It can go through a high trust or uh, a similar type of rigorous check and it certifies and it's safe. Only then we will implement it in the consumer-facing world. Yeah, I have a friend that he's a software engineer and, um, or, or actually, he's a, I don't know, I think he manages engineers, but they, they build software for like MRI machines and things like that. He was telling me that, yeah, they're still using way, way uh, outdated, you know, kind of technologies because they have to give, make sure that it's, you know, completely safe and secure, that there's not going to be any bugs in this. So they're using, you know, like older versions of .NET Framework and things like that just to make sure that there's no no issues. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. There's there's just a lot of opportunity in, in, in general. And as, as data is increasing, your access to systems is increasing, uh, your exposure is increasing as well to cyber hacks, to, you know, security issues, to privacy compliance issues. So I feel like it's a moral responsibility of a lot of like B2B tech teams and leaders to build software in a secure way that it can then be exposed to uh, the larger commercial, you know, world, uh, especially folks who are in healthcare and 
finance in some of these high compliance driven industries. Yeah, I think you definitely need to make sure you've uh, uh, set it up, you know, err on the side of caution there. You want to make sure that you are uh, as safe as possible because uh, once that, you know, healthcare data is out there, you can't really get that back. Correct. Correct. So what else, what else do we need to know about when it comes to, you know, the future of, of healthcare and health tech and things like that? Um, <laughs> The future of healthcare and health tech is bright. I feel like there's a lot of innovation going on in the world of healthcare today. You know, uh, COVID actually uh, just shook the whole health system um, and asked a lot of uh, folks who have been in healthcare for a long time to really drive uh, more innovation. And uh, I'm sure you're seeing the utilization of telehealth with just you know, it just became center stage because you can't go to a brick and mortar, you know, um, provider office. So a lot of work going on in telehealth and virtual care, remote patient monitoring, continuous data capture remotely, um, access to rural um, healthcare to rural population using telehealth and virtual care. There's a lot of work being done there. Um, there was a lot of like emphasis on mental health, behavioral health post COVID as well. So a lot of insurance companies like ours are now bringing in, um, in the past, which what was a supplemental benefit is, is uh, or which was not even a benefit is now being brought into as supplemental benefits. Outside of just clinical care, now uh, health, mental health, behavioral health, social determinants, it's all coming more mainstream and it is being uh, offered by health systems because we, uh, I I think your a lot of your clinical, uh, your medical uh, burden of care also depends on your social, your uh, you know mental health, your social well-being, your economic well-being, and so forth. So um, a lot of work going on there. A lot of work going on in uh, genomics, right? As as it is being democratized and uh, the cost of it is lower to to predict, uh, you know, more heavily on. Uh, what can happen, how disease will grow in a person's body, um, how can you counter, um, how, how can you build a lifestyle so those diseases don't trigger because of your uh, genetics and so forth. So a lot of work being done there. It's becoming mainstream. Um, you know, a lot of work in cybersecurity as data is increasing, there's security around that. It has to be uh, built upon. So a lot of work being done there, a lot of work being done in data, in AI. So I feel like on the tech side and on the healthcare delivery side, there's, there's a lot happening right now. It's a, it's a great time to be in healthcare because you are at the center of these innovations and you get to uh, work on them and you get to see them and you get to see how the next decade is really going to uh, transform with the utilization of technology and all the other things, how healthcare will improve, because I think it's uh, it's time. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you 100%. Uh, this has been a great conversation. How can people connect with you online and learn more about the things that you guys are doing? Well, LinkedIn, for if you, uh, you know, if uh, budding entrepreneurs who uh, want advice can reach out to me, folks who want to get into healthcare uh, and don't know how can reach out to me. Folks who are in healthcare and want to know how they can do more or move up in their careers can reach out to me. LinkedIn is one of the best ways uh, to reach out to me. And there, there, there aren't too many unmesh Srivastavas out there. So if you put my name <laughs> on it, uh, <laughs> I'm sure you're going to find me uh, one of the four or five people who are out there. Uh, so um, yeah, connect, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. We can talk and you know, I don't like marketing, so the, uh, sales pitches. So please stay away from a lot of sales pitch because you know there's uh, there's just too much information coming at you. But if you need uh, genuine advice, I'm here. Um, as it relates to Clever Care, please go on our website, um, uh, Clever Care on Clever Care Health Plans website. And if you have parents who are aging into Medicare or are already on Medicare Advantage. Um, and you want a healthcare system which is different. We are in California right now, but we are growing very quickly. So um, if we can cater to your parents, we promise you that we will consider them as our parents and we'll provide them uh, experience that we would love to provide to our parents. So uh, have them sign up 
there's OEP, uh, ongoing enrollment period going on right now for another week. So uh, please have uh, them sign up and, uh, you know, we would love to uh, uh, service them. Um, yeah, that's it. Awesome. Well, I'll link that up in the show notes too at eclutter.com so we can go there and link into your LinkedIn and also link to Clever Care. Um, Amash, I really appreciate it. I, I enjoy the conversation. I feel like this is a bit official and it's a bright feature for healthcare tech. Absolutely, Josh. It was a pleasure talking to you and thanks for having me on your uh, podcast. If you enjoyed that episode, please uh, leave a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. I'd greatly appreciate that. And also don't forget to check out merch. We have some t-shirts that uh, I've designed that are on geekleader.com. Um, You can click on the merchandise uh, section there and check that out. And also don't forget about the books from our guests. So if you like this guest and other guests that have written books, please um, go ahead and check that out at geekleader.com. I would greatly appreciate it, and I'm sure they would too.